words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. And tonight, we're looking at some lines, some paragraphs, some sentences that have meant so much to many of us from this simple book. And what I want to do is just read a passage, and then we can sit with it a little bit and get comfortable, just kind of let it flow over you, and then we'll work with it just a little bit, see if we can't find a prayer in there. I mean, this is material that you all know. Some of you know it very, very well. So just sit in like an old friend, huh? We should not think of the spiritual disciplines as some dull drudgery aimed at exterminating laughter from the face of the earth. Joy is the keynote of all the disciplines. The purpose of the disciplines is liberation from the stifling slavery to self-interest and fear. Forgive us when we've taken these practices that you meant to bring life and we turn them into legalisms. Forgive us. Joy, is that really what you have for us? Might you remind us times throughout our life where practices have brought great joy. May it be so. Francis Finlon writes, Happy the soul which by a sincere self-reunification, holds itself ceasingly in the hands of its creator, ready to do everything which he wishes, which never stops saying to itself a hundred times a day, Lord, what should I do? Does that sound impossible? The only reason we believe it far beyond us is that we cannot understand Jesus as our present teacher. We've been under the tutelage for a long, oh, when we've been under his tutelage for a long time, we see how it is possible for every motion of our lives to have its root in God. We wake up in the morning and lie in bed quietly praising and worshiping the Lord. We tell him that we desire to live under his leadership and rule. Driving to work, we ask our teacher, how are we doing? Immediately, our mentor flashes before our mind that caustic remark we made to our spouse at breakfast. That shrug of disinterest we gave our children on the way out the door. We realize we've been living in the flesh. There is confession, restoration, and a new humility. We stop at the gas station and sense a divine urging to get acquainted with the attendant, to see her as a person rather than an automation. We drive on, rejoicing in our new insight into spirit-initiated activity, and so it goes throughout our day. A prompting here, a drawing there. Sometimes a bolting ahead or a lagging behind our guide. 
like a child taking first steps. We're learning through successes and failures, confident that we have a present teacher who, through the Holy Spirit, will guide us into all truth. In this way, we come to understand what Paul means when he instructs us to walk according to the flesh, not according to flesh, but according to the Spirit. we forget that you are ever present to teach and guide us. In the midst of everyday life. Give us a picture, give us a vision about how you'd like to be engaged, involved in all the details of our life. Show us what that might look like to go even deeper, even now, into life with you. When we despair of gaining inner transformation through human powers of will and determination, we are open to a wonderful new realization. Inner righteousness is a gift from God to be graciously received. The needed change within is God's work, not ours. The demand is for an inside job and only God can work from the inside. We cannot attain or earn this righteousness of the kingdom of God. It is a grace that is given. And so, Father, forgive us. Trying to do things on our own. Teach us to let go. Trust in your providence. We come before you ready to receive. Do the work in us that you desire. come to the end of this study, but only to the beginning of our journey. We've seen how meditation heightens our spiritual sensitivity, which in turn leads us into prayer. Very soon we discover that prayer involves fasting as an accompanying means. Informed by three, these three disciplines, we can effectively move into study, which gives us discernment about ourselves and the world in which we live. Through simplicity, we live with others in integrity. And solitude allows us to be genuinely present to people when we are with them. Through submission, we live with others without manipulation. And through service, we are a blessing to them. Confession frees us from ourselves, releases us to worship. Worship opens the door to guidance. All the disciplines freely exercise bring forth the doxology of celebration. The classical disciplines of the spiritual life beckon us to the Himalayas of the Spirit. And now we stand 
at the timberline, awed by the snowy peaks before us. We step out in confidence with our guide who has blazed the trail and conquered the highest summit. Why do you put such a beautiful playground in front of us? We always get more out of it than we put into it. It's very good of you. All these different practices, these different invitations, might there be new ones that you're drawing us into? Might there be work that you'd like to begin with us? Might you speak clearly? And might we respond? sense the spiritual disciplines are not hard we need not be well advanced in matters of theology to practice the disciplines recent converts for that matter people who've yet to turn their lives over to Jesus Christ can and should practice them the primary requirement is a longing after God As the heart longs for flowing streams, so longs my soul for thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Oh, too long after you. So many of our longings have become distorted and bent, curved inward. Might you open up our longings a little bit? Might you show us what's going on? These longings for safety, security, intimacy, longings to be loved. And so often we can take these in destructive ways, straighten them out, show us where we can come home. Go underneath and behind the destructive longings that sometimes preoccupy our lives and sometimes bring great destruction. Go beyond them. Show us how you have what we really want. You have what satisfies. Satisfied with nothing else. All the glittery things in this world fade away. We want you and we want to do it together as a community. 
thank you for all these practices that you've taught us. May we respond well. No. They, they don't know you're joking when you do that. They're concerned. I'm 110. <laughs> he actually just had a birthday. I did. 76, right? Did I get it right?
You good? All right, all right. I want to know, you were like in your 30s when you wrote this book, right? And how can you write so well but can't hold a stinking microphone? <laughs> Seriously, do you ever go back and go, how did I do that? Or where did that, you know what I mean? Like, this is my son saying this. That's what he was thinking. How did he do that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, you know. Well, How old were you? What? When that was written. I was four. I like the line about snubbing your children. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> Well, let's move this conversation to a little more productive. Yes. We, we have a, a guest whom I didn't realize until late last night was here. Roy Carlisle, the editor for Celebration of Discipline, is with us. And so, Roy, could you come and... How about, yeah, <laughs> yes, it's true. Not much. <laughs> maybe, you, maybe you could share just a little from a publisher, editor perspective, how uh, Celebration came about, and uh, Richard's, remember Richard, uh, what was his last name? Lucas. Lucas, and it, he was the Jesuit guy, and his feelings about it. <laughs> This young whippersnapper. So am I really gonna, I'm going to share these stories. That, Just a little, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, first of all, you heard the other night that Richard came to see me when I was speaking at a writers' conference, and he brought me a one-page outline, exactly like it is today, exactly. And I looked at it and I thought, well, I like this guy. He's a nice guy, but he's a Quaker, <laughs> and nobody knows him, and he's writing about Catholic stuff. <laughs> but we had a nice conversation, and I took it back to my publication board. Now, you don't know how publishing works, and I don't expect you to, but in publishing, when you're doing books, you have a board. publish it, which is usually what they say. And we sat around the table, and everybody said, he's a Quaker. <laughs> and nobody knows him. <laughs> and he's writing about Catholic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of flabbergasted, because that is exactly what I thought. And then nice <laughs> Richard Lucas, oh, I'm going to. Yeah. Richard Lucas was our marketing director and a Catholic priest. He died of AIDS many years ago. He was my best friend at the publishing house at Harper. And Richard Lucas said, I don't care. I think somebody should write about the Catholic stuff. Because the way Catholics write about it, nobody reads it. <laughs> Everybody around the table said, well, yeah, but how are we going to sell it? And Richard, as the marketing director, said, I'll figure that out. And of course, we knew he didn't have a clue how he was going to do that. <laughs> but our boss, Clayton Carlson, who Richard knows, said, you know my philosophy. Roy, if you and Richard believe in this book, I'll let you do it. And I didn't know what the book was. I didn't have a book. <laughs> All I had was a piece of paper. <laughs> Normally, I have more than that when I make this decision. <laughs> a lot more than that. Um, he did a little more, but I didn't have much. And Richard Lucas and I said, OK, we want to do it. So we went ahead. 
Now I'm going to tell you a story that I haven't told people. <clears throat> we couldn't sell the book. It came out. We had trouble selling it because, why? He's a Quaker. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows him. And he's writing about Catholic stuff. And um, Christian bookstores at that time in the 70s didn't really trust that. So Richard and I and Richard Foster went on the road. And Richard Foster knows a little of this, but I spoke to bookstore chains. And I said this. This is what I told them. I said, as an editor, when you're publishing books, there are three questions that go through your mind and a fourth that isn't quite articulatable. The first is, will this book sell? That's the first question every editor has to ask themselves, and it's a legitimate question. You don't have a publishing house, the books don't sell. The second question is, is this guy a celebrity? Is he known? And the third question is, do you think it'll win some awards? <laughs> well, the first question, we said, no, it probably won't sell. The second question, nobody knows him. And the third was, I don't think so. But I said, there's something else going on here. And especially remember this when I was talking to a bookstore chain that doesn't exist, the Logos bookstore chain. I said, sometimes you publish a book, and I've published 700 books in my career of 40 years, I've got maybe five that this is true of. Spirit of the Disciplines is one of those five. I said, sometimes there's a book that is more than a book. It does something to people that is more than just reading. It does something to people's soul. It does something that changes their life, which is why when I came out of seminary, I wanted to be an editor. I wanted to see people's lives change. And I told that group of bookstore buyers, this is that book. If you read it, you'll know this is that book. And pretty soon, it started to happen. And it took a while, it didn't happen overnight, but Richard Foster spoke to people, I spoke to people, and the traction began, and pretty soon, what Richard has done is, has changed my sense of what happens in Christian publishing. And that's a whole other story, but nobody had written about the classic disciplines the way Richard had done it. And to this day, I can't tell you how he knew how to do that. I mean, he read them, of course, and he understood them, but most evangelicals had never done that and never written about them in that way. And just because, I guess, the transformation that happened within him came out to all of us and changed our lives forever. What are you going to do with that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was cool. Okay. Do you, you want some questions? Sure. Can I do that? Sure. Okay. Or did you want to comment anything on that? What Roy had no, to say? No, let's let it stay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just the first line of the book. Does anyone know this line? Who knows that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Super fishy. Curse of our age. Yeah. Superficiality is the curse of our age. That's a really good first line. I like that. <laughs> if you were Roy writing, helped. <laughs> if. Just where I was wanting to go. Thank you, Roy. <laughs> what would you say today? 
Well, distraction is, I, that's one of the things that I write about, is a primary spiritual problem today. And we all know we don't have to go through all the uh, issues as to why that's come about. But, uh, and, and uh, you know, speed reading is a modern invention because most books today only deserve five or ten minutes. <laughs> and so learning to focus our attention is one of the great tasks that we have. Now, I'm all for multitasking, I think it's wonderful, but I want to put a word in for unitasking <laughs> so that we learn concentration. And I was telling Nate, uh, last year I made a decision, this is just a simple example, to um, take a single book I worked with it for nine months. It was Julian of Norwich. Her showings are sometimes called revelations of divine love, but for nine months, see what I could learn. And you know, amazing in the sense of the, what the focus does to stay there and how contemporary, how relevant the issues that Julian, that those 16 revelations that she received, you've, many of you've worked with that book, the uh, first book uh, written by a woman in English, um, and uh, she starts out with the great question of the problem of evil. Why is there so much evil? Why is this? And of course the, uh, the, uh, the um, phrase that we all remember is, and uh, how's it go, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. However, they, most people, for, forget to add the first phrase that goes with it, which is, um, evil is necessary. Is that Sin is inevitable. That's, 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 there that's it is. not a direct quote. That's Sin paraphrase. is inevitable, but all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. And God shows her, you know, uh, things about the crucifixion that would make, what's his name's, uh, uh, the passion, uh, Gibson's uh, look like playground stuff. I mean, this was so gory, and most people turn the book off right then because it's just so. But, uh, and, the, and then her question of, of um, uh, is this a safe world to live in? Remember, the Black Plague went through her city six times in her life. Uh, we think that her, we don't know for sure, but that her husband and children were killed in the Black Plagues, and then God shows her the chestnut. Is it chestnut? Hazelnut. Hazelnut, thank you. In your hand, I've had held it. And, and how God holds us, and so forth. And, and then, of course, she's dealing with the question of... of um, uh, I'm so unworthy, I'm, you know, and God tells her the story of the master and the servant and sends the servant out and the servant clumsily falls into a pit and the master comes and looks and, and the servant is, I'm such a rascal, I should have watched where I was going and I'm terrible and I'm awful, how could God love me? God, God says, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And then the great revelation in the fourth, the fourth question is, how can I be loved? And God uh, speaks to her uh, and uses the image of a mother holding a child. And that satisfies Julian. Well, anyway, 
to be able to focus and see how that we can learn and grow in grace simply by concentration. Now, it's so crucial because um, our distraction keeps us from hearing God. You know, our young people go off to some camp or something and they, they come back and they say, God spoke to me. And then they get back into the press of life and God stops speaking, right? Oh no, they stop listening. What happened at the camp experience was incredibly simple. All they did was to get rid of enough distractions for a long enough period of time in order to concentrate. That's all. So learning those disciplines today, pretty important. So distraction, your practice of saying, I'm just going to spend nine months with one book. It yeah. opened up, because you'd read Julian before. But... Lots of times. And yeah, you know. give you a chance to dig in. Mm -hmm. Now, you'd mentioned last night another yeah. kind of critical piece. That you alluded to it. Yes, and I'm trying to remember it. Ah, spirit of our age. <laughs> <laughs> I'll help you. <laughs> narcissism. That narcissism is the spirit of our age. And we need to knock that in the head as leaders about ourselves. Because this, this sort of, I mean, it's perva all pervasive that I am overwhelmingly important and everybody should pay attention to me and you'll know, you know all that stuff. And we just need to ruthlessly root out a spirit of narcissism. How do we do that? Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> Since I'm very important and knowledgeable, I will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really curious. I'm, I'm assuming this, some indirection would be helpful. I mean, I mean, I'm with you in the sense that you mentioned that the other day, and, and it, I mean, it's a cultural value that goes unchecked, that we don't often think about, and it's certainly integrated into our Christian communities. Now, how do we deal with that internal sense of wanting to be seen and noticed, wanting to be praised? Let me give, uh, the old writers had these two phrases. I had something I wanted to read about them. Yeah, we're dropping everything here. It's all right. Do you like my alarm clock? <laughs> <laughs> the two phrases feel like opposites. Contemptus mundi and amor mundi. Contemptus mundi is this uh, rooting out of any desire. Uh, let me read what I wrote about that. It's here somewhere. Contemptus mundi, being torn loose from all earthly attachments and ambitions. And then Amor mundi, being quickened to a divine but painful compassion for the world. In the beginning, God plucks the world out of our hearts. Contemptus mundi. Here we experience a loosening of the chains of attachment to positions of promise. Pro, pro, pro. What's that word? I don't, don't ask me how to read. Pro, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> power. And all our longings for social recognition to have our name in lights begins to appear puny and trifling. 
we learn to let go of all control, all managing, all manipulation. We freely and joyfully live without guile. We experience a glorious detachment from this world and all that it offers. Contemptus Mundi. And then, just when we have become free from it all, God hurls the world back into our heart, Amor Mundi, where we and God together carry the world in infinitely tender love. We deepen in our compassion for the bruised, the broken, the dispossessed. We ache for and pray for and labor for others in a new way, a selfless way, a joy-filled way. Our heart is enlarged toward those on the margins. Indeed, our heart is enlarged toward all people, toward all creation. It was this reality, this Amor Mundi, that hurtled St. Patrick back to Ireland to be the answer to its grinding spiritual poverty. It was Amor Mundi that thrust St. Francis of Assisi into his worldwide win ministry of compassion for all people, for all animals, for all creation. It was Amor Mundi that drove Elizabeth Fry into the hellhole of Newgate Prison, which led her to her great work of prison reform. It was a more moon day that caused William Wilberforce to labor his entire life for the abolition of the slave trade. It was a more moon day that compelled William and Catherine Booth to serve tirelessly among the homeless of London, which eventually led to the founding of the Salvation Army. It was a more Mundi that sent Father Damien to live and suffer and die among the lepers of Molokai. It was a more Mundi that propelled Mother Teresa to minister among the poorest of the poor and throughout the world. And it is a more Mundi that compels millions of ordinary folk like you and me to minister life in Christ's good name to our neighbor, our Nibor, the person who is near to us. <laughs> so this this idea of detaching but yet drawing in, right? And then the, the list of leaders, yep, who were able to do this. Yes. What do we do with that? How is that helpful? What does that look like for us? Yeah. What does it? I don't know. I like it, and I really like thinking about these people who are uh, withdrawing, but then you know coming back. And so, for for us as people who are engaged in work of spiritual formation, and for many people here, uh, it's a very important part of their life, their career. What does leadership look like uh, with that principle in mind? Well, can I read to you a passage? Please. from one of my real heroes, Frank Laubach. Yeah, go for it. And he was on the little island of Mindanao. Many of you maybe read his, uh, know his story and his great work of literacy. Uh, but he, there on Mindanao, he um, had this experience of prayer. And I wanted to share it with you maybe as an example of how we can learn a more moon day, okay? Yes. You came all prepared, didn't you? Oh, <laughs> I just had these things. Listen, listen to this passage, this little prayer experiment. This afternoon has brought a wonderful experience. I closed my eyes to pray. Read Laba. Read his letters by a modern mystic. He, I mean, he wrote about 50 books, so, but read Laubach. I closed my eyes to pray, and I saw the faces of those before me, 
than those in the houses nearby, than those down the line and across the river and down the highway to the next town and the next and the next, then in con concentric circles around the lake and over the mountains to the coast, then across the sea to the north, then over the wide ocean to California, then across America to the people whom I know, then over to Europe to the people whom I have met there, then to the Near East where my missionary friends live, then to India where I have other friends, to others in China and to the multitudes who are suffering the dreadful pangs of cold and starvation around the world in less than a minute, and for a time the whole of my soul seemed to be lit up with a divine light as it held the world up to God. Amor Mundi. That's good. That's good. I wonder if, like I mentioned, there's a number of people here in positions of leadership and stepping into other things and the question of the future comes to mind. And this conference has this peculiar title about the future, envisioning the future. What do you see the future of the spiritual formation in terms of a movement? You had mentioned once that um, some people were asking who would arise or something. <laughs> you want to? Well, it's this, there's a sense of, I mean, Dallas is gone. And, and, you know, in terms of your public life, mm -hmm. you're, you're right there. Mm -hmm. and, and, well, can we have a new king? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, it's so important for us first to know that there are many right here in this room that are doing these things. So we don't need to look, just look around you. There's plenty of folk doing the work and good work. And then second, it's important for us to know as leaders that one of our main tasks is to take people off of us and put them on Christ, who can be their present teacher. And then, We just recognize the great sovereignty of God who raises up people as he chooses and in the time and way that he chooses. And we learn to rest in that. Does that make sense? That's good. Could yeah. you say just another line or two about taking people off of us? Mm. Um, Roy had used the phrase, uh, Christian celebrity is a contradiction in terms. It, th this is not where we are. And any time we get wrapped up into that whole uh, stuff, uh, and I know it sells books, Roy, but but that stuff's straight from the pit. So we learn to serve others. If you can possibly do it, uh, avoid fame. Uh, learn to value anonymity. Now, I know, I know. It's one of the things we need that's part of Contemptus Mundi. And that goes back to the narcissism. Right. Right. To value right. anonymity. Right. And to, I mean, there is, when putting people off of us, I mean, that can be, uh, <laughs> wow, if they don't need me. <laughs> that's right. And of course, as you all know, one of the great reasons for the discipline of solitude 
is to teach us that the world can get along quite well without us. And, yeah. and we just have to learn that lesson. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let me see if I can just pull a few things together here. Okay. In that uh, distraction, the idea of unitasking, and just, I mean, I love the idea of what book are you going to read this year? <laughs> you know, one book. I like that. Um, partly because I'm a really slow reader. But, uh, and, then, and then the idea of narcissism, kind mm -hmm. of curse of our age. Mm -hmm. and, and how important it's that the is. spirit of the age spirit see, of the age okay so that we just see that it's it's culturally ingrained all over the place and uh, we've got to we've got that, that, that if we're really going to be a leader we have to deal with that severely severely champion anonymity at least valuing anonymity. At least come to know how good it is. How wonderful. You know, oh, Pat here knows we hike sometimes in a little canyon nearby. You know, the squirrels and the deer, they don't give a hoot what you've written or how important you are and become their friends. Like They'll it. teach you. They'll teach you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.